What's up, guys? Welcome back to episode three of the Crypt on the No Money But Dreams podcast. We have Mr. Bashir here with us today. What time is it over there, my man? Uh, just going 1 a.m. Melbourne time. 1 a.m. Melbourne time, and we are 7, 7 10 UAE time. Uh, yes. A lot has happened the past week. I think we have a lot of things to talk about. Officially today, Three Arrows Capital went into liquidation and are bankrupt. I was shocked. I mean, we've been hearing all that news and everything, but if you had told me that would have happened two months ago, I would have told you, no, it's impossible. We have a couple of exchanges not allowing people to take their crypto or limiting. I was worried Binance was going to limit, but the limit's $8 million. So I don't think I'll have any issues trying to take anything out of Binance. <laughs> Okay, fake hole, fake yeah. hole. So anyways, let's get started. Let's take a look at this past week. Let's pull up uh, the Bashir charts and take it from there, buddy. Cool. What you got going on on a macro level, man? Cool. We'll, we'll cover S&P 500, Euro, um, touch on some precious metals, jump into energy markets, and then we'll always wrap up with crypto. And then we'll take it from there and actually just try to focus on more so the week ahead rather than the, the week in review. So I'm just going to chuck my glasses on here, guys. So appreciate your patience. All right. So rocking and rolling. There's actually been a bit of strength here in the S&P 500. We talked about the potential for um, a nice relief rally towards that 39.84 pocket. Um, first resistance level it needs to clear is 38.54. However, first and foremost, um, if we do get a nice daily close above that level, we should see a nice move towards that pocket, um, but that is only a three and a half percent move, which if we look at what the move was like actually off the lows up into where we had closed on Friday, um, that was about two and a half percent. So it was just another percent more than what we had seen. Uh, but yeah, again, I'm not really sold on this, uh, you know, sell off into, or sorry, this big buy up that we had heading into the close on a Friday because, you know, you usually, one of the strategies that does quite well on the S&P 500 is you usually buy the close and you sell the open, which is a strategy that, you know, you can do on a daily basis and you can back test this to see whether there's any validity to it. But that's a strategy that's outperformed buy and hold. So I'm not really sold on this move until we get a nice close above 38.54. Uh, and we could be range bound for a week as well. There have been some absolutely massive moves in US equities. Uh, but yeah, like the, I saw this really uh, jarring stat that this is the most uh, you know, poorest real yields in the last uh, 50 years almost in terms of the Yeah, S &P since 1970, 500. right? Yeah, worst, worst first half. And, and uh, it's just you look at things like what the actual earnings results have been across the first half of the year from companies that have announced earnings. And this is the, the worst, not just in terms of price performance of shares, that's obviously a given, but also the, some of the worst earnings reports that we've seen in a long time. So macro is still looking like a, a dog's breakfast. So yeah, just <laughs> keep keep that in mind whilst you're going from there. Risk so markets, have, to markets time, generally yeah. are forward looking. Do you think that the markets had priced in the fact that we were going to have such poor earnings, or do you think that the markets are still readjusting? Do you think that we're going to have more bad news coming from the earnings side, and how do you think that's going to affect asset prices? I, th I think that yeah, maybe a little bit more of that is going to come through, but. Uh, you've now got some like recession fears or that are coming yeah. through. And that's why you're seeing really depressed prices. So yes, markets are forward looking and they're trying to price in the next event. And the next event right now is no longer, uh, you know, overvalued uh, tech companies or overvaluation concerns in general. You know, people aren't wanting to pay really high PE multiples anymore whilst inflation is running high and the raising rate environment is ongoing um, because, you know, the, it just it just wouldn't work for that um, you know you need a low inflation high growth environment for to justify those kind of pe multiples um, mm -hmm. but then when you're seeing what we're seeing now is more so the biggest weight on equities and other risk assets is the the fear of a recession that we're, the federal reserve as well as other central banks are going to be raising interest rates whilst global economies are slowing down uh, and yeah. so that's why they're kind of seeing this kind of depressed price action and 
you know, even though we had a, a nice little lift off the local lows and, you know, we had that double bottom that we mentioned last week as well in terms of yeah. where we've moved from there, you know, we've moved 5%, but still like 5% up whilst we're, you know, uh, down horrendously is, is nothing really to, to kind of look at. Yeah, um, and it's very much mind. looking like it's going sideways, right? It's not really yeah, deciding look, which direction it wants to go. Like I said, 38.54, that's the level to watch. We break that, you know, there's a potential move for a nice move to the upside, but we're still probably heading into some uh, resistance from that trend line that we kind of pointed out uh, that we had tested up a couple of times. So one, two, three retests, you know, again, you know, we can kind of come into that pocket. There's a bit of confluence there with the trend line as well as the kind of uh, previous range swing high so we can kind of come into that pocket and then break down again uh, on the back of some you know uh, missed expectations or whatever um, but yeah nonetheless the technicals are just painting what is a grim macro picture and you know there, there hasn't been anything that's changed from last week to this week to um, say that we got to look for a different tune but you know always remain optimistic and and uh, if you're the kind of trader that is only investing for the long term, then you know you can preserve your capital now. It might not be the time to redeploy, it, but once you're feeling that kind of confidence shift and the charts are looking better, then that may be your signal. But um, moving on to where it could be a signal that you can generate that from is actually the the euro dollar right now is something that we would need to potentially be watching um, because again the the USD strength is also weighing on risk assets because again in a fear driven market, things like the US dollar for better or for worse tends to get bid up. So these, these kind of assets are doing quite well for the time being. So yeah, I would look at the Euro dollar as kind of like a leading indicator. I'll just get rid of some of this um, over here. And then that way we can kind of see the charts a little bit more clearly. But the point I'm trying to make is that with the Euro dollar still at around 104, which is historically quite low levels, um, mm -hmm. there, there hasn't been any kind of relief. And I think that with the USD strength, which is like just a kind of a demand for liquidity, uh, whilst other assets are getting their liquidity removed, uh, is something that is to be watched. But, you know, what is an interesting thing to watch here as well is the play on the USD ruble as well, because, I mean, that is a pretty, uh, you know, relevant currency to be talking about at the moment uh, just because of the fact that you know when you look at it they have performed actually a lot better since the start of the Ukraine crisis than they did beforehand so if we would actually have a look at how uh, the USD ruble has fared so we saw you know the ruble weaken significantly at the onset of the war um, and this is where it was trading throughout you know 2020 2021 and now it's actually doing a lot better. And that's because Russian companies are forcing, uh, you know, European nations to sell their currencies or to sell US dollars, which has almost been the default currency for trade or the reserve currency for trade. And they need to settle in rubles if they want to continue to receive their gas, which has created a quite a natural bid on the ruble. And now it's actually strengthened um, significantly as well. And so, you know, against the, the US dollar, which has also itself been exceptionally strong against other currencies, whether that be the Aussie, the Euro or the pound, um, you know, it's kind of like the cleanest shirt in a pile of dirty laundry. And <laughs> the, the thing is, is that, you know, what we're seeing here is some really massive macro shifts. You know, you've got Saudi Arabia talking about potentially joining BRICS, which is Brazil, Russia, India and China in their coalition. Uh, and kind of creating this new um, commodity-backed currency, which would be traded freely amongst each other. That's, you know, again, there's a lot of uncertainty in the markets. Markets don't like uncertainty. Something like that would throw a real spanner in the works. Prices would continue to get hammered across risk assets because until there is, you know, I'm not saying that it's going to be perpetually bad because of this inclusion of a new world reserve currency, but whilst things are uncertain or there is a transitionary period, there's going to be a lot of concern. So, you know, if we see the ruble back at uh, around 80 on the USD and, you know, euro strengthening as well, these are things that can lead towards saying, okay, sentiment is shifting a little bit more 
and there is a bit more of a risk on appetite. USD weakens, people are selling USD or you know piling their USD into equities and risk assets because anytime you buy a risk asset, whether that be shares or crypto or Bitcoin or whatever, you're trading the denominator, which is US dollars. And so yes. if you're long on those other risk assets, you're short on USD. So you're selling USD to kind of bid into those assets. So that, that's kind of um, something I'd be looking at. Um, what is interesting, though, if we were to briefly touch on gold, is we talked about this massive level that's coming in at around 1800. Let me just drop down to a smaller time frame just so we can uh, make sense of it a little bit more. We're talking about 1800, and now we it just, just peaked its head below that level and got bid back up uh, heading into the close on Friday. So, you know, that is actually a bit of a bullish sign for me on gold that. You know, it had this massive level at 1800 that it had lost very briefly and then it got bid back up into the close. I like seeing that kind of strength where key levels are getting respected. Um, and so we had seen that. Now, that doesn't mean that we can't have a breakdown in prices. But yeah, like right now, 1800 is still holding up uh, quite strongly. So that's like not a bad entry for kind of like a swing high, which is where we've been kind of testing up the upper levels around 1877. Uh, so we can, you know, set, try for a retest of the upper range that we've established quite clearly on gold. Uh, so that'd be a nice potential trade throughout the course of um, next week. If we're talking about from a macro landscape, that's something to be keeping an eye on. But yeah, I, I do think that uh, gold, despite the fact that it hasn't performed as well as some of the gold mugs may have hoped, it has held up pretty well, despite the fact that there has been quite a lot of global uncertainty, which... Um, kind of helps bolster its store of value use case. I know Peter Schiff is probably doing a victory lap at the moment. Um, you know, he's been you know, riding this uh, train for a while. So, yeah, that's just another market that I'd be keeping an eye on. But, you know, look, we're, we're the crypt. So let's get into the cryptos. Um, I want to touch briefly on Bitcoin and ETH, and then we can kind of just discuss the, the week ahead and what you're looking at uh, there, Alex, so we can get looked after. So I've actually got a, an alert here for our, like that 18, um, 18,500 level. Uh, that's a really big, interesting level for me. I, I'd be I'd be looking to bid that level pretty hard just because I, I don't think that, look, prices can definitely head a lot lower, but a lot of these concerns that has been uh, ongoing, it's, you know, again, I've, as I mentioned before, markets do not like uncertainty and there has just been uncertainty after uncertainty after uncertainty in the crypto markets you've got um voyager halting withdrawals you've got kucoin now having a bank run you've got 3ac filing for um insolvency or bankruptcy so you know it's it's just a really grim picture and obviously this is a word that's been coming up across crypto twitter for a while now it's contagion you know the fall of terra luna had exposed players who had really poor risk management or had been over levered. This is not necessarily a bad thing. Short term in the price action, it's going to be pretty horrendous. If you have bought earlier, you're feeling bad. But this is actually a good thing for the ecosystem because there is a great deleveraging. Yes, the prices are looking horrendous. Price action is pretty bad. But, you know, this does clear the playing field and gets rid of the toxic debt. And as I mentioned in last week's podcast, Bitcoin has continued to produce a block every 10 minutes. Nobody's had to step in. No centralized authority, no government has had to step in to continue to ensure that the underlying technology works. Again, this makes me really bullish because if I wanted to send you, Alex, in Dubai some Bitcoin right now, despite the fact that the prices have been getting sold off for however long they have been, I can do that and it can settle within a few minutes and it would be in your possession within one or two block confirmations, you know, 20 or 30 minutes later. So that's not bad considering that, you know, again, it's been getting absolutely slaughtered and getting sold off. Mm. But it just goes to show that despite the poor price action, what it's intended to do is continuing to work. And, you know, the fact that I could remit a payment to you on the weekend without waiting on the banks, again, that just goes to show me that, you know, we're, we're working on something really special here. So, but anyways, enough of my tirade. We had seen a uh, $70 million liquidation on this pump here that Bitcoin had off the lows, so it got, kind of got sold off. Um, and it had like a 12% pump in a couple of hours. 
majority of it done over two hours. So in two hours, we had $70 million worth of short liquidations. Um, and it, look, yeah, that was predominantly led through Binance. Traders were looking to fade the move. They did fade it quite well. And now we're trading at levels similar to where the pump had occurred, um, coming in around that 19.2K pocket. But as I've mentioned, I'm deeply interested in 18 and a half. We, we got so close in that sell-off and I would love to have been a part of that pump, but such as the life of, uh, of a <laughs> trader or investor, you know, I literally missed my entry by <laughs> uh, 18, yeah, like $138 on BTC. I was so mad, but hey, look, it is what it is. It's not a problem. You know, you, you set up and you load up for the next one. So yeah, that's, that's one thing I'd be watching. And again, um, 20, 20K, um, proving to be that kind of magnet area for any potential pumps. So again, buying up 18 and a half in the hopes that you can sell or offload some at 20K. I'm not talking about spot here. I'm talking about perpetuals spot. I'm just perennially bidding. I'm not looking at selling spot anytime soon. I don't try to play that game. Um, but if you want to try out some perps with very, very low leverage or on a demo account, just to kind of get your practice in, that's one thing to do, looking at 18 and a half bids, selling at 20. Um, it's probably a safe range to play out for the time being on Bitcoin. Uh, and again, if we get to break above 20K or you know get some bullish momentum, 21.6 cannot be ruled out. But right now, there isn't a lot of narratives or factors that can be taken into place that can say, yeah, I'm going to go out and buy hundreds of thousands or hundreds of millions, or if you're an institution, billions of dollars worth of Bitcoin. Michael Saylor did come out recently and buy a bit more Bitcoin, which was good to see. And um, the president of El Salvador went out and bought some more Bitcoin as well. So their dollar cost averaging in the right direction now, no longer having to buy tops. They can actually buy some local lows for once, which is great to see that these massive players are uh, trying to, you know, better their entries. However, they're still down significantly on uh, their their average entry price, but you know, I'll leave that for them to worry about. And but again, if we are looking for narratives, and this is again maybe clutching at straws, but I've just said that it's so easy between me and you, Alex, now to send payments. I don't need to ask for permission to anyone. You don't need to wait until it's your Monday or Tuesday to receive funds. You know, it's just it's easy, does it? And you know, you just need to give me your Bitcoin wallet address. So I love the fact that despite however horrendous things may be on a price action standpoint, everything that it's intended to set up and do, it is doing. Uh, but I'll, I'll move on to Ethereum now. Um, ETH is very similar to BTC in the sense that it broke below that, you know, nearly broke below that 1K level, which was that one sand. Obviously, BTC lost 20 right now. We're trading well below it, um, whereas ETH is just holding over that level at the moment. So, very similar to towards BTC, I'm probably looking at 850 to 900 as potential buying pockets and selling at around 1,150 as well. So that's something I'd be looking at if we're trying to play ranges on ETH. Uh, again, it's just we're, we're trying to find some sort of bullish narrative here. We're trying to find some sort of reason to, to get long and strong. Uh, but again, the merge that's going on, that's still a few months away. So the fact that, you know, the, the one major bullish narrative is the Ethereum moving from proof of work to proof of stake. Uh, that's the one bullish narrative that's coming. But even that is, you know, four to five months away. So you know, that, that is a little bit further down the line. But nonetheless, I think that seeing Ethereum at prices that it hasn't seen in quite a long time, it's kind of cool. It's also one thing to kind of keep an eye out that this market is a lot more reflexive than Bitcoin. So if Bitcoin moves down 5%, you can probably see ETH down 8 9% on the day. Um, I did see something really interesting that I wanted to point out on, um, on the daily, however, which is I think that there, if we are going to lose this 1K level, there is a massive area of support on this market but it's all the way down towards like that 400 pocket right so i just wanted to kind of point that out that this is the real area of interest that i'd be watching next up because that had provided some support in the previous um 
like, you know, bear market that it had back in 2017, 2018. Mm. It, you know, got completely annihilated, went to 400. From that 400 pocket or just shy of it, it kind of rallied quite quickly and pumped 114%. So that kind of reflexive action around 400 and also having provided some resistance prior to it ripping um, in the previous bull run that we had just witnessed, that is a really interesting level for me to be watching. But yeah, if it loses a thousand, you know, when we lost that kind of uh, 1700 level, it teleported to 1400. When it lost 1400, which was a previous all time high, it teleported to 1K. So there is a, a potential teleportation zone here. I'm not saying that it's going to be like, you know, in one candle, but, you know, over the course of a, a couple of days or even a couple of weeks, we can see it reduce even from current levels another 62 percent from current price action so and and again that might actually be forming a nice little confluence between the merge actually occurring and the price level of around 400 occurring you know it gives people you know this wonderful opportunity for an easy 10x potentially because if there is a likelihood that it's going to retest its previous all-time high what level it gets to after breaking it, that we'll have to wait and evaluate at that time because it's too, uh, I guess it's it's too airy fairy to kind of speculate that far ahead. But pick up 400 and we go towards 4.8, which is the previous all time high. That's a pretty easy 10x um, over the next couple of years potentially. So, you know, that not saying that I'd want to see ETH drop another 60%, but. You know, buying ETH at 400 again, that's a pretty generational opportunity for an easy 10x because, you know, you don't have to worry about whether, you know, it's going to make it or not. It's been around since 2015. NFTs are built on it. Almost all of DeFi is built on Ethereum. Uh, so I think that, you know, in terms of the layer ones, it's obviously the most battle tested. So the likelihood that it can face and be ready for another bull run is highly likely. I'm not saying that it is guaranteed, but it is highly likely to see another bull run and, you know, from there to retest its previous all-time highs. If it gets down to 400, you're going to be like, oh, I could have gotten an ETH at 400. Well, it was there, but it was just, it was coming down and looking like a dog's breakfast. So it probably didn't instill a lot of confidence to buy it. Whereas <laughs> you, sure. know, you get that conviction to buy at 4.8, but it's funny how market psychology works. But yeah, I think that's one thing that I'll be, I'll be watching as well. And, um, looking at, at last, I just want to quickly touch on uh, on energy because it's still above 100, and you know we had um, yeah that's that's we're not going to see better or improved ma uh, macro conditions whilst oil's above 100. So you know that's one thing that I'll be watching as well. So very closely. For sure, man. I totally agree with you on the point about ETH. Um if you does get down to a 400 level it's going to be a once in a lifetime opportunity to buy in and after being involved in nfts and all the discussions we had and actually seeing how useful this can be as a, as a form of trading value just i mean just as bitcoin is but eth definitely the volume of transactions which we're able to go through the amount of DeFi which is built on it. Uh, it's so resilient. I don't see it not testing all time highs once again, when the sentiment completely changes. But if you and don't the have one a thing I did want to place, touch, you mentioned, you mentioned there, one thing I wanted to touch on is DeFi has actually held up ex extremely well during these really volatile conditions. Right. 100%. I think that that's pretty impressive that all these CFI lenders like BlockFi, you know, you got um, Celsius, of course, the big name that kind of really kicked this whole saga off. Um, they're, they're all going under, whereas, you know, uh, all these vaults like uh, Maker, you got Compound, um, you got Balancer, you've got Aave, they've all been working exceptionally well. And, you know, on-chain liquidations work, over-collateralized loans do work. It's just, yeah, it's fascinating to watch. But sorry, I didn't mean to drop. I was just like, funny that the comparison holds true even you know 100 percent, and the same thing goes for bitcoin i think if anybody wants if anybody believes in crypto now and they didn't have a chance in the last bear session to to get in then it's a great opportunity now but i think you need to have a strategy so it's important obviously when you say okay i'm planning on that's the level i'm planning on buying in at you know what i mean and 
sticking to that. When that level comes, you pull the trigger regardless. You don't say, oh, I'm going to change my strategy just because of the psychology of that point in time. And I think that the opportunity cost of not buying Bitcoin and ETH right now is just way too high. If you are looking to invest money and you don't want to just only hold the fiat currency, you don't want to be a point where you're sitting, slapping yourself, hitting yourself, being in the next bull run when it does do a 10x. When you could have 10x your money, regardless of how much it is, whether you 10x $100 or you 10x a million dollars, those kinds of returns are outsized and once in a lifetime, to be honest with you. We've seen these yeah. prices go to the all-time highs. As you said, I think it's a very fair point. There's no need to speculate, oh, ETH is going to go to 60,000 or Bitcoin is going to go to 1 million. That's a bit far-fetched. But them actually retesting their all-time highs, probability is quite high. And we're not talking about next month. We're talking about in two or three years. But if anybody came to you and said, listen, I can 4X, 5X, 6X your money now, guaranteed, anybody would jump on that. You know, mm. so yeah, 100%. the theory yeah, hasn't then... changed. The technology hasn't changed. Yes, sir. Uh, it's just all still there. And I think the fact that Bitcoin and ETH have held up all of this is, is a testament to them being the OGs. And what happened in the dot com bubble when it burst? You know, how much was the price of an Amazon share? It's the same kind of thing, man, in a lot of ways, in my opinion. So I'm definitely dollar cost averaging. I got my salary at the end of last month. Took in a portion of it, said, this is it, going straight, 50% Bitcoin, 50% ETH, close my eyes, done. Take it out of the exchange, happy days. And, nice. and that's kind of the way that I'm doing it. And then obviously trading a bit, trading a bit on ETH quite a lot, and trying to figure out what's those your pockets. Strategy? What's, your, what's your strategy there? I have an open order to go back up at 1,070, sorry, 1,045 or something. I feel like that's kind of my area where it just keeps bouncing off again. And just trying to play it on a daily basis, kind of how I'm feeling at the time while looking at the movements in the market. I and mean, it's obviously early days for me, but enjoying it, man. Playing with a small amount, something like $400, up like 15% between T. But every single position, I take a stop loss and i take a profit take so really trying to control that and control my emotions more than anything uh, from what i can see is it's how do you keep clear-headed and focused and not allow your emotions to try and chase a trade or not get out of it when you should be or get on the long side of a trade so i actually the last time we were talking i had two or three trades where i was I was short and obviously the other week during this week ETH went up and I held them and they little do you know they came back down and I was back in the money again. So it's also patience, you know what I mean? But I, I learned not to chase another trade again to the point where I'm negative like 50-60% of the capital which I have in the account. Yeah, nice. And that's really smart having a nice strategy and building up with a small account, kind of cutting your teeth there because a lot of the time people will... Um, have a bit more of a trading approach towards whether it be cryptos or other assets or other markets, a bit more speculative, like, oh, yeah, I think it's going to go up, so I'm going to go long, or, yeah, this thing's going to go down, so I'm going to go short. Like, But there's no real nuance. There's no real strategy. You know, if you do anything in life, whether it be, you know, going to the gym or, you know, even you know, looking after your family or whatever it is, if you don't have a plan, if you don't have a strategy as to how you can actually undertake that task it's just going to go poorly and so yeah just having a real clear concise idea as to where you're getting in where you're getting out and you're answering those questions for yourself before you're entering the trade which puts you in yeah. uh, in front of 99 percent of traders so kudos to you yeah no i totally agree and i learned that from you so trying to <laughs> keep it tight no man i, I learned that from uh, many many better traders than myself like one book i read trading in the zone that was a fascinating book. Mark Douglas touches on a lot of this. So I actually have that on my Kindle. I'm supposed to open that. I'm supposed to read it pretty soon. So I'm going to get through to that for sure. Nice. That's a, a crypt alpha leak for you guys trading in the zone. <laughs> no, I'm going to read it this week, inshallah. Anyways, man, let's wrap it up. It was a pleasure to have you. Sleep well. Thank you as always. And thank you guys for waiting, everyone who stayed till the end. And see you next week. Take Thanks, gentlemen. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.